I'm Tom Long, and this week we're going to be looking at a few short parables that kind of wrap up the first section of parables in uh, Matthew's Gospel. I, I've had the privilege of uh, attending quite a variety of different worship services. Um, very liturgical ones like Episcopalian and Roman Catholic and uh, ones that were closer to, to uh, I don't know, just very spontaneous, uh, almost chaotic uh, Pentecostal uh, services. But one of the things that no matter what the liturgical tradition might be, one of the things that you see in almost every Christian church is the use of the Lord's Prayer. There's a phrase in the Lord's Prayer uh, where we are taught by Jesus to pray, thy kingdom come. And no matter the liturgical tradition, that prayer tends to be repeated because it's the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. But what really is God's kingdom? In the Gospel of Matthew, unlike the other synoptic gospels, the, God, God, the kingdom of God is referred to as the kingdom of heaven. And the concept is so important that in the Gospel of Matthew, we hear that phrase, the kingdom of heaven, 31 times. So pretty, pretty key to uh, our understanding as a Christians. So what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? And, you know, if you, <laughs> if you think about it, in Jesus' day, it was a lot more common to have a king who was really a king who could uh, make dictates and expect them to be followed decrees and they became law and but the the key to understanding the kingdom of heaven is the second phrase in um, the lord's prayer which is thy kingdom come thy will be done so the most short succinct way i think to put the kingdom of god is the kingdom of god is where god's will is done <clears throat> Now, where is the kingdom of God? Where do we see God reigning? And I think this is, a, is not an easy question for us. We look at the world around us and, and we see injustice, we see poverty, we see the poor and working class exploited by the privileged um, in order to become even richer. Uh, we see racial inequities we see injustice. Uh, where, where do you see the kingdom of God? And I think in order to know where to look, we need to understand a little bit more. We need to understand a little bit more about what the kingdom of God is actually like. And that's where the parables for this week fit in. Now the first couple of parables I'm just going to read to you from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. He, Jesus, told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. <laughs> can, can you imagine uh, kneading yeast through 60 pounds of dough? That's a lot of work. I've done just a loaf of bread and it takes some, takes some effort. In fact, uh, my preference is just to make frozen pizza on Friday night because if you make pizza the way that it tastes the best, you actually have to make the dough one or two days in advance and do cold fermentation for 24 to 48 hours before you actually bake the pizza. Um, so we're not willing to wait like that, but that's the image that Jesus is talking about. You plant a seed and you wait for it to grow. You knead yeast into the dough and you wait for it to grow. And the kingdom of heaven is like that. So. It's got small beginnings that may be hard to notice, but over time, it's going to grow into something great. 
So it may be hard for us to be aware of, but the kingdom of heaven is there and it's real. The next parable that Jesus tells in verses 44 through 46, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So <laughs> this really raises kind of an interesting question to me. It's like, what, what kind of treasure would be worth you know, selling your house, selling your land, selling your, uh, the tools that you use to make a living with, selling everything you have so that you can get that treasure or, or get that pearl. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is that great of a treasure. It's that great, that precious of a pearl that we would give up everything in order to possess it. So that's our second clue. It starts small, even though it's going to become something big. So it might be hard to notice, but it's also when you find it, it's going to be of such great value that you're willing to give up everything. And earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So you give up those things, you make those sacrifices in order to get the kingdom of God, but then so much more. So much more blessing is added to you and you become so much more of a blessing to other people. Now the last parable, a lot of people get hung up here. Let's listen to this one. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bat away. That is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that weeping and gnashing of teeth in the furnace and so forth, people, people get drawn off into that. But first, let's talk about when this happens. It's not gonna to happen today. Well, it might happen today but there's no promise it's gonna to happen today or in this millennia. It's at the end of the age that this is going to happen. And the judgment isn't going to happen. Uh, I'm not gonna be in charge of judging. And guess what, neither are you. We will not be doing that final judgment of what's evil, what's good, who's evil, who's righteous. That's, that's not our job. God's gonna send his angels to separate out those that he has judged to be righteous or unrighteous. And I think when we think about the kingdom of God in terms of what we've already discussed, that place where God's will is done, that situation in which God's will occurs, uh, and that it starts small and grows big and that it's so valuable that you're willing to sacrifice everything, you begin to see what Jesus is talking about in this last parable, which is at the end of the age, or as John puts it, let me just read this verse. In 1 John 3, 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not, been, has not yet been made known. So there it is again. It's small. What we're going to be is so small you can't see it. But John continues, But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So even though the uh, what has started in us isn't, the full picture. Uh, what John is saying is that there will come a day when we see Jesus face to face and at that time everything that is wrong with us, our bad habits, our, dis our destructive addictions, everything that is pulling us down, all of that downward weight is going to be destroyed. It's going to be judged. It's going to be thrown into the fire and we are going to rise up clothed in the righteousness of Christ, not in our righteousness, in the righteousness of Christ. And that's when we become like Jesus. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's the end of the age, when we come before Jesus. So, what is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? I think we have a little bit more insight into that. I remember the story of a child walking with their mother and 
the mother is holding their hand as they walk through a very poor neighborhood where there are a lot of broken windows, there's a lot of graffiti on the walls, and occasionally the mother would point at a window that had a, a window box full of flowers and say, hope lives there. Now a lot of people would walk down those streets and they would never see the window box, they would never see the flowers, and they would never say hope lives there. Another story that I remember is about Fred Rogers, you know, you know him as Mr. Rogers, uh, talking about when he was a child being scared because upsetting things he had seen in the news and uh, they, they were bothering him. And his mother said, whenever scary things like this happen in the world, look for the helpers. So when we're talking about seeking, seeking the kingdom of God, that's what we're talking about. Look for the flower box where hope lives. Look for the love being put into action by the helpers, the ones rushing in to the towers after 911, the ones going where the hurricane just hit to put the power lines back up. If you want to see the kingdom of God, look for the helpers, the ones that put their love into action. It's here, but you've got to look for it. You've got to seek the kingdom of God. And so that's my invitation to you this week. Look around. It may be small. It may be hard to find. But seek you first the kingdom of God. And as Jesus says, all these things will be added unto you. Leave them to God. Put them in his hands. Thank you for sharing your time with me at the beach today. And I hope God blesses you in this message.